Good evening. Good evening. Uh, uh, this, tonight's event is the first in a series of three we've organized this semester, um, uh, sponsored by the Latino Latin American Studies Program here in St. John's, uh, St. John's, focused on the theme of Latinos in U.S. politics. Uh, before talking a little bit more about that, I want to draw everyone's attention to a poster on the back door here that uh, <coughs> my colleague uh, Dennis Beach has asked me to advertise um, running the Latino Latin American Studies program. There's a number of things on campus, including these uh, semester programs. We also do some short-term study abroad programs. Uh, Brother Dennis is taking a group to Cuba in May of 2017. So check out the poster, check out Brother Dennis Beach. Um, talk to him if you have any questions. Um, like I said, tonight is the first in a series of three events. Uh, following tonight's presentation on October 11th, uh, we will host uh, Latino Politics in the Era of Bad Feelings, a uh, presentation by Adrián Pantoja, who's a professor of political science from Pitzer College in California, who will address what is often referred to as the Latino vote in uh, the U.S. In the current electoral cycle. Um, the third of the uh, three um, uh, will take place on November 1st, one week before uh, Election Day, and it will be a panel discussion for Latino and Latin American students speak about the 2016 elections. And these are um, uh, students, St. Benz and St. John students, who will be talking about uh, their perspective on uh, this year's elections. Um, and that's an event co sponsored uh, by the Latino and Latin American Studies Program and at the ELAP Student Organization. Uh, tonight's speaker <coughs> is Dr. Jimmy Patino. Dr. Patino earned his doctorate in United States history from the University of California at San Diego and joins us from the University of Minnesota, where he is assistant professor of Chicano and Latino studies. He is completing a book titled A Time for Resistance about Chicano movement struggles against immigration policies in the San Diego border region. His broader research, teaching, and writing explore multi-ethnic solidarity and conflict, Chicano-Latino history in the US, transnationalism, social movements, as well as hip hop and other forms of cultural resistance. In addition to his scholarship and teaching, he serves on the Advisory Council of the Immigration History and Resource Center at the University of Minnesota, he is on the curriculum design team of the Ethnic Studies Initiative of the Minneapolis Public Schools, and is a board member for Tamales y Bicicletas, a Latino community youth organization that works for envir environmental justice in South Minneapolis. Tonight, Dr. Patino presents <coughs> Caravans of Sorrow, Caravans of Hope, Immigration and the Latino-Latina Struggle for Social Justice. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tamales. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Um, good evening. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to this great series. It's quite an honor. I want to thank in particular Dr. Brian Larkin, Dr. Bruce Campbell, Norman Ketter, as well as the staff and faculty of the Latino and Latin American Studies program here. It's fantastic to touch base um, with you all here. Um, I'll, I'll get started. Um, Caravans of Sorrow, Caravans of Hope, the name of my talk, um, is a quote taken from um, a woman named Luisa Moreno. Um, she, she quoted it in 1940 um, in, a, in a speech she was giving. Um, Luisa Moreno was a Guatemalan immigrant, which was rare for the 1920s and 30s. Actually, of, um, her family was upwardly mobile. Um, she came to go to school at a Catholic university in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but she very quickly became a vehement labor organizer and advocate for Mexican, particularly Mexican-American laborers um, in the 1930s and 40s. Um, I, I used the quote of her talk for the talk because by caravans, she was referring to um, Mexican and Mexican-American, both born in the US and born abroad, born in Mexico or, or other parts of Latin America, as caravans of sorrow, um, as folks who were migrating to different places, primarily, primarily to work in the agricultural industry, in the mining industry, and increasingly in industrial factories, even up here in the Midwest um, at this time. 
Um, so I, I take her notion of caravans of sorrow as a call to look at the repressive circumstances that these folks were in, right? Um, caravans of hope, which she also uses to describe the same population at the time, um, she also sees the same group as fundamental to the future of the country, <coughs> right? Um, it also, so I think she's calling on us when she calls them caravans of hope to think about that these folks, although in difficult circumstances, um, always fought back, always try to create alternatives. And so I'd like to structure the talk in this way by looking at what kind of structural issues, particularly in what I call the immigration regime, um, emerged in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Um, and at the same time, and, and especially focusing on how did this group of folks um, imagine something different, um, mobilize to resist the circumstances, and imagine something different. So in particular, I think um, this group of um, mostly Mexican and Mexican-American leftists in the United States in the 1930s, if we listen to their voices, we get a very a much broader sense of what the immigration, is, immigration debate is about. about. Um, and I hope we see that um, the immigration debate is nothing new, that these folks have created a tradition within the Mexican American community um, calling for alternatives to it. Um, so on that note, I'll get started. Um, the first kind of notion I want to um, you know, share with you is the idea that the notion of the border patrol, the notion of border policing itself, and the notion of a quote unquote illegal alien um, is historically constructed. Right? I think sometimes today in the debates um, about immigration, there's the assumption within the narrow way it's talked about that deportation is inherently or naturally part of the solutions to immigration. And so I want to start with thinking about the origins of the Border Patrol itself that was created in 1924 as a way of kind of understanding that, again, border patrolling as a solution to immigration issues was constructed for particular pur purposes and particular reasons. Um, so this is an image of the early Border Patrol, again, created in 1924. And to think about the ways that Border Patrolling has been invested in, um, we'll think about its meager beginnings. Um, initially, in 1924, it numbered 140 agents, and they had to supply their own horses and their own saddles. Right, so I thought this image kind of captured that, that notion. Um, Thinking about today, the Border Patrol successor, ICE, Immigration Control and Enforcement, employs about 19,000 people in 2013 and has a budget of $5.87 billion, right? So this is one kind of narrative of immigration as a, as a bureaucratic um, practice that it, it continually was invested in throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century. So we're gonna go right to the beginning here. So again, the Border Patrol was created in 1924 as part of the Johnson-Reed Act or the Immigration <coughs> Act of 1924. Um, the first thing that we need to think about when we think about this act is that it was, it was explicitly, um, it used racial logic explicitly. It used race as a category that was believed to be a type of science at the time um, in the way it was created, right? And so what it did was give quotas to all the countries in the Eastern Hemisphere um, about how, what number of folks could migrate to the United States. Um, the overtly um, racist way it, uh, its provisions were was that it, included, it excluded all Asian folks. All Asian people were no longer eligible to be naturalized, right? So this is in the 1924 Act. Um, it was thought that um, you know, Asian folks could not properly assimilate into the United States because they inherently were culturally different, right? Um, and so this is the explicit way that this act was, was um, racial in its origins. Um, it also sought to reduce the numbers of Southern and Eastern Europeans as well. Um, they were still able to migrate and naturalize. However, um, their, their quotas were much smaller then the larger group were Northern Europeans, right? Germans, um, folks from the British Isles, and Ireland were the largest numbers of groups. So that was the preferred group of folks that 
um, the immigration policy wanted to bring into the United States. So that's the overt way that it was racialized. It's also a subtle way that it was racial, right, in the ways that it, that it um, attended to Mexican origin folks. Now, Mexicans um, were not restricted. Mexicans could still migrate to the U.S. and still could naturalize um, to become citizens of the United States at this time. Um, this is not because of the, the, restrict, the group of restrictionists who wanted to exclude um, what they call undesirable populations. They wanted to exclude Mexicans. Um, but what very powerful group do you think still wanted access to Mexican migration, still wanted Mexican migration to continue to come? Any ideas? Agriculture? Agriculture in particular, yes, and larger business interests who were had already for decades utilized Mexican labor um, in, as, you know, as laborers in their fields and in their, in their uh, industries, right? So they lobbied um, um, to exclude Mexicans from being um, not included, from, from having quotas, right? So the entire Western Hemisphere um, was not subject to quotas in this act, so that um, the, the uh, agricultural lobby would still have access to, to uh, laborers. Um, and this is not because they were any less racist than their restrictions counterparts. Um, in fact, they argued that Mexicans were naturally disposed to working in very hot temperatures. Um, they were short and cl closer to the ground, so they could um, they could pick crops easier. This is in, this is in congressional um, you know uh, information sessions, right? Um, but they had they had an interest in, in accessing Mexican laborers. Um, so the way scholars have talked about um, um, the continued kind of what folks at the time called the Mexican problem, there was a fear that Mexicans would become another race problem like African Americans in the South, um, that the creation of the Border Patrol and the creation of the category of illegal alien was a way to, while they could still migrate, the, there was a police force to manage this population. Right, and be sure that they went back when they were supposed to. And again, this is what the agricultural lobby argued, that um, you know, they're not going to stay. They're not going to become part of the country. We just want their labor, and they're going to go back home, is what they would say. Right? Um, didn't quite work out that way. Um, but this is a very important point that scholars have made up to this point, that the notion of the legal alien became a way that um, the US state could manage and um, send back or um, you know, intervene in this population, right? So the immigration historian May I puts it that illegal, quote unquote, became constituted of Mexican, which comprised both Mexican immigrants as well as Mexican Americans. Um, and so uh, this is a very important way that um, kind of a colorblind racism, if you will, that we've talked about in more recent history um, on paper, an illegal alien can be anybody who just, it just means you don't have your documents, right? But in practice, because of age-old ways of um, segregating and stereotyping Mexican origin folks, the way it was applied was to target this population in particular. So this is a very significant moment in Mexican-American history because you have this new, what I call a regime. I call it a regime because it was, it was a way to manage the day-to-day life of folks. It was ingrained in the day-to-day -day practice of the society. Um, so this became a new barrier for Mexican-Americans who already um, were under you know, challenging circumstances. Um, let me ask you too, how did the first generation of Mexican-Americans become part of the United States? Any ideas? 19th century, kind of a big event. Territorial expansion. Territorial expansion, the Mexican-American War, where the um, United States um, acquired more than half of Mexico's territory. There were about 75 to 100,000 Mexican origin peoples in that place that, so to speak, overnight became part of the United States. Um, in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, these group of folks were given access to citizenship. Um, however, on the ground, that wasn't practiced. In fact, um, something akin to an apartheid system was put into place throughout the Southwest 
um, that subjugated Mexican Americans. So Mexican Americans already had that kind of part of their civil rights struggle, right? To authenticate the treaty and the access and access to citizenship. Now there's this other regime that is intervening in their lives in important ways. So the best way, um, one of the earliest ways that this was implemented was in the 1930s, where the first mass deportation campaign um, was executed, right? Um, so to think about the moment of the 1930s, um, um, of course there were long-standing Mexican origin communities throughout the Southwest, um, throughout major cities, Los Angeles, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, San Antonio, and by this time, in the 1930s, communities in places like St. Paul, like Chicago, like Kansas City, beginning to work in some of the factories. Um, and that's related to the 1920s. From, the, from 1920 to 1930, you have a doubling of the Mexican origin population, from 740,000 to about 1.4 million. Um, and this was because, um, largely because labor recruiters actually sent recruiters into Mexico or into, into the border region and recruited folks to work, especially in the agricultural fields and in other industries that I've um, described as well. Um, many Mexicans were also fleeing um, some of the violence and disarray of the Mexican Revolution of the 19-teens as well. So there had been a, a large increase in Mexican origin folks from 1920 um, up until 1930. Um, so this, this is for a lot of the reason why this population gained so much policy attention. And the first enactment of this new deportation system was executed beginning in the Depression era, beginning around 1930, when the Hoover administration, um, you know, not getting good publicity because it's being blamed for the Depression, comes up with the idea that deporting Mexicans will be a solution to the lack of jobs during the Depression era. Right? So this is called the Mexican repatriation. And there were signs like this that came up all over the country, particularly in the Southwest, some of the Midwest um, as well. Um, the first ever deportation raid occurred at the, at the Placita and Overa Street in the historic Mexican district of Los Angeles. Have people been to Los Angeles before? You visited Overa Street? It's the historic center of Los Angeles where the Spanish-speaking Settlers founded the city, basically. You should visit, if you go to Los Angeles, you should visit on the street. They still have pretty good food, too. Um, but this was the Mexican body in the 1930s. Um, and the border patrol surrounded the Placita and, um, you know, came in and began to interrogate folks. They only deported about 15 people. And as reportedly, some of those folks were Chinese and Japanese. So they weren't even all Mexican, right? Um, but the larger effect was to intimidate the community. The community itself began, became aware of it, of it being uh, cast as a scapegoat, right? And that there's this police force that is, that is there that can <coughs> sweep you up and take you back <coughs> to Mexico. Um, by and large, this also started a reaction among state and local authorities that encouraged and intimidated Mexican folks to leave the United States. Um, the Border Patrol actually didn't have enough resource and infrastructure yet to actually execute a mass deportation campaign. So this was largely executed at the local um, and state level. Um, primarily looking at the welfare rolls. If Mexican origin folks were on the welfare rolls, local county welfare offices would identify them and begin to um, um, intimidate or um, convince them to, to go back to Mexico. Um, so this is, this is a very important implementation of this, this, this new kind of system. Um, another example I can give is that deportation became a way to also quash dissent among Mexican Americans, right? When Mexican Americans would mobilize and try to call for justice for their circumstances, um, now sending in work patrol or sending in threatening with deportations was a way to stop those movements, stop those mobilizations. So a, a really good example of that is actually in 1931, the first ever successful desegregation court case was won by Mexican immigrant parents in a place called Lemon Grove, California, in, in San Diego, California. Um, and what had happened was the 
Mexican students were going to school at the elementary school with white students and some Japanese students. Um, again, 1920s, you have an increase in Mexican origin folks. Um, there's an increase in Mexican students in the school, and the school board decides to build a Mexican school in their neighborhood, right? And to send all the Mexican school, Mexican kids to this school. This was common practice in the Southwest. They called it Americanization schools. Um, they were, it was supposed to teach them how to, how to assimilate properly. Um, but the problem was that the, the Mexican parents said no. The Mexican parents told their kids, don't go to that barn. They called it the barn because the new school was inferior to the, to the original school. Come home until they let you back in the real school. Um, the parents then went to the Mexican consulate and got assistance from the consulate to get a lawyer and filed suit. They eventually won the case, like I said. Um, however, during the approximate three month period, when the students weren't going to school, right? It's illegal not to go to school. Um, compulsory laws, everybody has to go to school. The San Diego County truancy officer began intimidating the parents, right? Trying to force them to go to the new school um, or they would be deported. And one family, at least one family, um, actually more than one family, but one family in particular that was deported was a woman named Guadalupe Ruiz, who um, was one of the leaders of the parent uh, organization that was resisting the segregation effort. Um, she had eight children. Um, her husband had just died, um, and she was receiving welfare, as most folks do. Most families with a breadwinner passes away, you have access to welfare assistance. Um, she was also pregnant with her ninth child. Um, they intimidated her, and eventually the whole family was deported to Tijuana. Um, she was a very resilient woman and really resisted the the intimidation by the truancy officer. She was a former teacher in Tijuana. Um, four of the children were US citizens. Four of the children were born in the United States. Um, but the family was deported and lived uh, at least the rest of their kid life in, in Mexico. Most Some of them stayed forever. Some of them never moved back to the United States. A few moved back as adults. But this is a good example of how um, deportations were also used to try to stop social justice movements as well. And so, in this new context, this is this new context where you know Mexican origin folks have to deal with this circumstance. I'm really interested in how Mexican Americans responded to this new circumstance, right? Oh, so the larger repatriation campaign, uh, up to two million people were deported or repatriated at the time, and some estimate that that 50, even 60 percent of those deported were U.S. citizens. Uh, most of the U.S. citizens being children, as an example, the least family, right? So this was, you know, definitely a new kind of uh, situation in which Mexican origin folks had to confront. So one way they confronted it was the it was really the first kind of national Latino organization. It was called the Congress of Spanish-speaking People, and it emerged in 1939. Um, the Congress of Spanish-speaking People. And this is a mural. Uh, Luis Moreno, again, who's one of the founders of the Congress. Um, oh, oh, Congreso del Pueblo de Cal Español is what it says. And this, this is on the great mural of Los Angeles, where there's a, in the San Fernando Valley, there's this uh, wall where the history of Los Angeles from prehistoric times to the, to the present is on there. This is <laughs> honoring the Congress. Um, El Congreso is what it's sometimes referred to. Um, the Congreso emerged in, the, in, the, in a moment of the American labor movement, right? Um, at this time, because of the Depression, you have a lot of folks in dire circumstances, folks starving, folks definitely without jobs. Um, so folks are upset and beginning. Some folks are storming their city halls. Some folks are um, demanding from their government officials that something be done, done about the Depression. Um, a couple of organizations um, take advantage of the situation to mobilize these folks into, into organizing, particularly into labor unions. Um, so the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, um, a group of folks break off from another labor organization called the American Federation of Labor um, and decide to organize workers that the AFL was not organizing, right? The AFL historically had organized skilled workers um, mostly white workers, mostly male workers. In fact, a lot of them practice discrimination clauses in that people of color cannot be part of their unions. 
The CIO, in the moment of the Depression, decides to organize unskilled laborers, right? To organize African Americans in the South and other places. To organize Mexican Americans, to organize women, um, immigrant populations, and whatnot. Um, so this is occurring all over the country. Um, similarly, in, in relationship to, um, there was a Communist Party in the United States. And the Communist Party of the United States also had the same practice of organizing communities of color and kind of uh, putting folks of color into positions of power in their communities, whether it was African American sharecroppers in Alabama, um, you know, industrial workers in, in, in New York City, or in the, in the case of Mexican and Mexican Americans, cannery workers, agricultural workers in the Southwest, right? And so um, the CIO and the Communist Party are interlinked, right? They're, they're not this, quite the same thing, but there are communists in the CIO. Um, and, and so this creates a vehicle through which um, Mexican Americans can um, advocate for themselves, right? And so, um, again, Luis Moreno was a major leader of this. And just to give an example of the kind of on the ground work they were doing, um, she organized a number of workers. She organized cigar uh, makers in Tampa. She organized garment uh, factory workers in New York City. Um, but what she became most known for was um, she was in charge of organizing cannery workers in Southern California, in the Los Angeles, kind of San Diego sector. Uh, cannery workers um, canning tuna and fish and seafood. Um, those types of workers tended to be over 90% women um, and mostly Mexican origin. There are also other immigrant communities like Russian women as well in some of the canneries. And so she organized these folks um, and even got many industry leaders to sign non-discrimination agreements. Um, some of them had discrimination uh, clauses that wouldn't hire African American or other folks of color. Um, so this, this shows how workers of color were uniting labor concerns with civil rights concerns, right? And so this is what she was doing in Southern California. Um, she also got large canning firms like the Van Camp Seafood Company to get wage increases. Um, they were, in, in Southern California, this mostly female and Mexican origin group of workers were the highest, had the highest wages in packing tuna in the country. So they were very successful. This Ucapawa was the acronym for this particular uh, labor union, the cannery worker union, basically. And so it was in these contexts where, where activists like Moreno engaged Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans and learned about the ways that the immigration regime was affecting their lives and affecting their, their uh, attempts to, to organize. And so to, to extend on the, on the Caravans of Sorrow speech, um, she gives insight into how, um, how she's understanding this, right? She says, the ancestors of some of these migrant and resident workers whose home is the Southwest were America's first settlers in New Mexico, Texas, and California. And the greater, greater percentage was brought from Mexico by the fruit exchanges railroad companies and cotton interests in great need of underpaid labor during the early post-war period, post-World War I period. They are the Spanish-speaking workers of the Southwest, citizens and non-citizens, working and living under identical conditions, facing hardships and miseries while producing and building for agriculture and industry. Their, sto their story lies unpublicized in university libraries, files of government, welfare, and social agencies. A story grimly titled the caravans of sorrow, right? So she's beginning to think about and giving analysis to the plight of these particular workers. And what's really important is uniting the concerns and interests of most Mexican American workers and Mexican immigrant workers, right? So you're seeing the deportation kind of uh, threat as something that both groups are threatened by, right? Not to mention their labor um, situations, their class and kind of race issues that they were dealing with. Okay, another good example of a CIO unionist who was beginning to contemplate and analyze the situation was a woman named Emma Tenayuca. Um, Emma Tenayuca was a Tejana. She was a Texas Mexican from San Antonio. Um, her family went several generations back, probably preceding the arrival from the United States to Texas. Um, and so she wrote, she was, she joined the Communist Party um, and used that space to begin to understand and discuss what the situation of Mexican-American workers was. And so in, in, this, in her essay titled The Mexican Question in the Southwest, she said, we must accordingly regard the Mexican people in the Southwest 
as part of the American nation, who, however, have not been so accepted heretofore by the American bourgeoisie. The latter has continued to hinder the process of national unification of the American people by treating the Mexican and Spanish Americans as conquered people. Right? So maybe naturally, as a descendant of maybe some of the original Mexican inhabitants of Texas that preceded the US takeover, she's looking at um, the plight of Mexican workers as related to the conquest of northern Mexico, right? That this led to their situation. Um, so this is a very important <coughs> idea that um, you know um, has leverage throughout the rest of the century in, in Mexican American communities in particular. Um, so she largely organizes. Uh, she organizes a number of types of workers, but she's best known for organizing pecan shellers in San Antonio. Texas was the center of the pecan industry. Um, being from Texas, I have fond memories of pecan trees in my dad's yard. And, my family's yard and whatnot. So the countries are all over Texas, right? Um, but it's very hard work to shell them. Um, so these are some of the most exploited workers um, um, within the, um, uh, the southwest of Pecan Sheller Company. Uh, Southern Pecan Company, excuse me. Again, more than 90% of Pecan Shellers were women. Um, up to 12,000 of them were of Mexican origin in San Antonio. Um, so they were paid very poorly, and they initiated a several month strike and asked Emma Tinayuka to lead that strike. Um, they were successful at raising their wages. And again, she's in engaging the Mexican American community, she's learning of, of how the immigration regime is affecting their organizing efforts and their day to day life. Um, she describes, she says, during the first series of demonstrations among the unemployed, in San Antonio, the Border Patrolmen were used against the Mexicans. Scores were herded before the United States Immigration Office and threatened with deportation merely for joining unions. <coughs> On one occasion, a number were beaten, including several American citizens. Again, that both U.S. Mexican American <coughs> Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants were subject to um, the, the harassment and violence of the Border Patrol. Right? She says the demand for the right to organize into unions without interference from the immigration authorities was immediately raised by the Mexican community. Um, and as a result, the, the struggle by the Mexicans around the issue, the Border Patrolmen of San Antonio have not been used again as a strike breaking <coughs> agency. So it was a major concern of Mexican American activists in San Antonio. And it sounds as if they were able to heat them off temporarily. But by and large, again, deportation was used as a way of dividing in. Uh, demobilizing uh, movements. Um, so out of this experience, she kind of goes a bit further in her analysis of the, of the Mexican American situation than Luis Moreno. She argues that Mexican nationals, and Mexican immigrants, hold historic rights in the territory regardless of their citizenship and call for the abolition of restrictions, economic, political, and cultural, and for the due recognition of the historic rights of the Mexican people and territory. Right? So she's extending the history of, of northern Mexico being conquered and the first generation of Mexican Americans being subject to conquest to uh, call for historic rights. Indeed, Mexicans have a treaty um, recognizing their rights. Um, she calls to extend that to Mexican migrants. Right? And she's kind of calling out this move that the state has done where Mexicans were the were the original inhabitants, or at least preceded Euro-Americans, right? And then somehow they become illegal aliens. Mexican becomes synonymous with foreign, which is quite an interesting concept for that to take you know, hold in the, in the American imagination, right? So Emma Yuka is calling this out, right? And, and calling for historical accountability of kind of US wars of aggression and imperialism, right? Um, so these were, these were some of the on the ground struggles that folks were doing that led to the organization of, of the um, Congress of Spanish speaking people. Um, the Congress of Spanish speaking people convened in Los Angeles in 1939. And they convened many of these CIO activists, liberal politicians, um, but mostly grassroots activists from all over the Southwest and even, um, even some from the East Coast and, and the Midwest but mostly from this mostly Mexican origin in the Southwest, to create a program and a, and a list of solutions 
to the problems of Mexican Americans, including issues with the immigration regime, but more broadly, labor issues, issues of <coughs> civil rights and whatnot. And so I'm gonna read, um, we still have the document of the 1939 meeting, right? I'm gonna read a brief part that describes the setting. So I try to imagine the setting, or maybe a setting like this in a big hall of folks meeting in Los Angeles, the first national kind of team organization um, and coming to meet. It says, on the evening of the 25th of April, 1939, there came together the delegates of the First National Congress of the Mexican and Spanish American people, ever to take place in the United States. The New Mexico and Arizona Social Club at 230 and South Spring Street, Los Angeles, California, was a host to a crowd of approximately 1,500 people who overfilled its, overfilled its assembly hall with official and fraternal delegates from Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and California, with guests of honor and many visitors, both Spanish and English speaking. The hall was gay with banners, flags of the United States and Mexico, slogans of the program of the Congress, and the platform decked with flowers. Delegates were sitting around their state banners and visitors to one side. The platform was filled with guests of honors and members of the executive committee from the various states. An air of excitement, festivity, expectancy, and friendliness pervaded the atmosphere. Overall, Senor Eduardo Quevedo presided graciously and hospitably. After an opening, num opening number by the Mexican American Orchestra, the national hymns of both the United States and Mexico were sung. Senor Quevedo opened the Congress in a few words of welcome and then introduced the guest speakers of the evening. And so this is just kind of a description of the moment. Um, and it's very important, I think, that this is 1939, right? This is the era of Jim Crow. This is the era where, where racial segregation is legal. Um, so it was, a, it was a moment of difficulty for many people of color um, for Mexican American folks to um, openly embrace their Mexicanness, openly embrace their Mexican American identity. And it was a Mexican American identity, right? The flying with the Mexican flag, the American flag, they're singing both hymns. Um, and so this is a you know, um, very kind of important moment in terms of the cultural identity that they're um, asserting at this moment. Um, and so they resolve several things about the immigration um, um, system. Um, and here's a few of them. Um, they go on record of favoring measures to prevent the destruction of families by deportations. They see deportation as inherently destructive to the Mexican origin community, right? Um, more specifically, they suggest every adult over 21 be eligible for, eligible for citizenship after being in the country for more than five years. Um, they call to amend naturalization laws to reduce the fees, to um, shorten the time limit to a reasonable time to become a citizen, a path to citizen, we might call it, citizenship. Um, they call for that no person be denied naturalization because of race. Again, the Act of 24 <coughs> used race to determine who was eligible and who was not. And this is kind of an act of solidarity here, right? Because Mexicans still have access to naturalization, unlike their Asian counterparts. And so the labor movement was very multiracial in its practice. There were also Asian workers in the canneries and the, and the agricultural um, industry and whatnot. So this is kind of a solidarity cry. Um, they call for the formation of departments in colleges and universities that will deal exclusively with the study of the political, economic, social, and educational development of the Spanish-speaking people in the Western Hemisphere. This is a prototype for Chicano Studies, right? Um, my department was founded in 1971. Um, Chicano Studies departments don't come into being until the late 60s, right? Here you have a 1939 document purporting the idea so that Mexican Americans and Latinos could learn about themselves, but also to educate the broader American public about the contributions and histories of this uh, particular uh, group of folks. That's pretty much verbatim our department's mission at the U and, and in other places in the country. Um, and they also call for the preservation of the Spanish language and uh, the practice of Mexican culture in the United States. They saw no contradiction between being Mexican, speaking Spanish, and being part of the United States. Again, that's, that's, that's a very um, important kind of stance to take in 1939. So these were four, they had a full program. Uh, labor, health issues, uh, political issues, foreign policy, and whatnot. But these are some key kind of um, interventions they made or solutions they suggested about immigration. 
Um, so um, this is really important also because within Mexican American history, this generation between World War I up to the 1960s was usually depicted as assimilations, right? Um, usually depicted uh, through this, this very important organization, the League of United Latin American Citizens, um, who were another group of Mexican Americans that emerged out of South Texas. They had very different ideas, though, than these unionists did. Um, uh, one, their position on immigration was to differentiate themselves as citizens from their immigrant counterparts. Right? Leave the United American citizens. You had to be a citizen to join LULAC. Uh, this is by and large, LULAC leaders were of the professional class. They were doctors, lawyers, business leaders in the Mexican American community. And so they had a very different politics, right? So one thing all my students learned in all my Chicano history classes is that the Chicano community never agreed about what to do about their circumstance, right? And so the Congress of Spanish-speaking people is a, is a juxtaposition, a very different position than, than LULAC. And in Chicano history, um, LULAC came to define the whole generation. Assimilationist, de-emphasize your Mexicanness, try to convince white folks to like them and that you're not a threat. Um, the Congress is doing something very different, I think. Um, it's, that's especially you know, um, seen in the position of immigration, right? So this is, this is one reason why, in terms of this geography, in terms of the history of this community, why these uh, Mexican-American leftists were, were important and very different ideas. Um, so to wrap up, unfortunately, the US was not prepared for the ideas, particularly in terms of immigration, that the Congress had, right? Um, change in, in labor laws, change in immigration laws, and basically making it illegal to be a quote unquote subversive during the Cold War era. These changes conspired to basically purge much of the left. You could be incarcerated for being a communist or being a quote unquote subversive, right? Um, so this undermined like the, the CIO and the labor movement. In many ways, it demobilized it um, by um, making it legal to be a subversive, right? So there was a mechanism to persecute these folks. Um, and if you were an immigrant, your citizenship, and if you were a naturalized immigrant, your citizenship could be stripped if you were a subversive, or if you were determined to be a subversive. Or if you were trying to naturalize, you know, that could be revoked. And that's exactly what happened to Luisa Moreno. Her experience is really a good kind of way of thinking about how these, the Cold War era, the McCarthy era, the Red Scare era, kind of really um, affected um, the social justice movements of Mexican Americans and other, other groups as well. Um, unfortunately, ironically, Luisa Moreno, again, she was a Guatemalan woman. Um, she was naturalizing um, her status in the early 50s. Um, she had married a US citizen, actually a former Navy, um, someone who used to be in the Navy. Um, but she was called by the Committee on Un-American Activities in suspicion for being a communist. Um, so there were these committees, government-run committees, that found people that they suspected of being subversive or trying to undermine the United States, and would put them on trial and decide whether you know, they would be incarcerated or whether they would, if they were immigrants, they could be expelled from the country. Of course, Luisa Moreno, there's no evidence that she was actually a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. Um, and I think was. She was clearly uh, part of the Communist Party. Um, um, but what happened with Luisa Moreno is, is very ironic. Um, uh, her gardener, a Mexican immigrant, was given citizenship in exchange for stealing documents from her house that proved she was she had relationships with communists. Right? So that was the evidence. So she was fighting for immigrant rights, right? And uh, a Mexican immigrant is given citizenship by um, basically telling the un-American committee that are giving them information that they said was proof that she should be expelled. So she was deported. Um, uh, and she was deported back to Guatemala. Um, her story is really fascinating. When she returns to Guatemala, she, she um, becomes involved in uh, the new left of center presidency of Jacobo Jimenez, who the CIA, one of its first projects was to overthrow um, uh, Jacobo Jimenez 
and she's exiled from Guatemala <coughs> a few years after she arrives there. Um, she, spending, she spends some time in Cuba and in revolution in Cuba, and she ends up in Tijuana at the end of her life. She had a tiendita, a little you know, tourist store in Tijuana at the end of her life. Um, I'm hoping some of my colleagues are writing um, her biography to get more information about that. But that's, you know, that's what kind of happened to, to Lisa Moreno. And Martina Yuka was a U.S. citizen. She was born in the U.S. So she wasn't subject to uh, deportation, but she was blacklisted. She couldn't get a job anywhere. She was impoverished for some time. But she did move to San Francisco, um, changed her. She had an alias name. Um, she got a degree in teaching and became a teacher the rest of her life. Um, but these activists sacrificed a lot in, in order to, really what they gave us is a legacy of ideas that later the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement, known as the Chicano Movement, would take up in the 60s and 70s. And we still have remnants of these ideas today in the Human Rights Movement, right? Um, other legacies, of course, they were part of, these Mexican-American unionists were part of the New Deal Coalition, right? A multiracial coalition that, you know, pressured for more labor rights, um, for a social safety net. Um, you know, you like your eight-hour workplace, you like your minimum wage. You know, thank the CIO unions, thank the Communist Party. These were their bread and butter issues in the 30s that were successful at getting implemented. So, the Mexican Americans were were part of that continuum. And again, these ideas um, move on, right? The idea that Mexicans have historic rights in the United States, and that somehow is um, uh, part of the solution to the immigration problem, um, is I think very well depicted in this image by Juan de Lopez, um, a Chicano activist in the late 70s, right? It's, you know, apparently the Mesoamerican indigenous ancestors of Chicanos are kind of pointing at who's the illegal alien, kind of pointing back at the US state, back at US society. And he's crushing immigration plans, right? So kind of, um, this, is, this is the exact idea that Emma Yuka introduced in the late 1930s, right? So um, the legacy of those ideas continued on into the future. And I could speak to that in q and if folks are interested. My book is actually on the Chicano movement kind of grappling with these ideas. And now I'm thinking about the earlier period and hence the talk. So I'll conclude with um, the quote from Luisa Moreno. Um, she said, you have seen the forgotten character in the present American state, a scene of the Americas. Let me say that in the face of greater hardships, the caravans of sorrow and the caravans of hope. They are organizing in trade unions with other workers in agriculture and industry. The unity of Spanish-speaking citizens and non-citizens is being furthered with the purpose of this movement to seek an improvement of social, economic, and cultural conditions and for the integration of Spanish-speaking citizens and non-citizens into the American nation. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer your questions. So we have a microphone, and we have time for questions. Um, so don't be shy. Raise your hands. I'll bring you the magic microphone. Unless you want to just melt it out. There you go. Uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting talk. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Right. It's OK. A lot of the recent scholarship in um, studying uh, immigrant radical workers has focused on transnational aspects of these um, movements. Mm -hmm. um, Italian immigrants, for instance, um, in the United States are very much connected to radicals in Italy. Um, so to what extent were the, the progress of Spanish-speaking people and these other uh, organizers that you mentioned, were they connected to or influenced by um, labor movements in Mexico, for instance? Sure. Great question. Thank you. Um, Right, like, like the, the, the piece I read from the Congress kind of document, there were obvious transnational connections, right? The, the Mexican flag, preservation of the Spanish language. Um, and more specifically, if you, if you keep reading, it starts listing the attendees, and there's a representative um, from some of the Mexican unions that are there, um, a representative from the Cardenas administration, 
um, in Mexico. And so they were very clear. I was trying to find an image of, there was a con Congress of Spanish speaking people member named Bert Corona, who was a unionist through, through the 1980s. He died in the early 2000s. So he's a very important figure. And he's kind of a mentor figure to later activists. There's a picture of him with Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo on one of his visits to, to Mexico City. And so he, he clearly was in dialogue with these folks and had these transnational connections with, with Mexican radicals in, in Mexico. Um, there's, it's hard to find documents of these folks. The 1950s you know, McCarthy era, folks were burning documents to try to avoid being you know, purged or deported or you know, apprehended for being um, um, you know, part of, a, of the Communist Party or related to them or whatnot. So unfortunately, it's hard to find more like archival evidence as a story um, because of that, that issue. But, um, but there clearly were, were these types of connections. The unionist, Mexican unionists were there. Um, they had a foreign policy program um, that's also in the, in the Congress document. Um, they're supporting the Cardenas administration and its nationalization of oil. Um, they're critiquing the Bracero program, which is a guest worker program with Mexico. Um, so they have the very opinion in about Mexican politics as well. And they're getting this through dialogue with some of their Mexican counterparts. Good question. Other question? I, I want to support that claim. This was a very, very good, enlightening talk. Thank you so much. I, I learned a lot, and I'm going to pass this information in the future to my own students. Sure. Uh, um, Emma Tenayuca and, uh, and Luisa Moreno definitely are on my list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's so many things so interesting, so many interesting things that you pointed out. Uh, I immediately thought of the year 1939 when you said that it was the first Congress um, uh, that happened. You know that year. Well, that on that year, Spanish Civil War ended with the victory of fascist of the fascist uh, fascist uh, regime. Yeah. It was the year when Second World War started, mm -hmm. and you know these two women. The presence of these two women reminded me a lot. Of, I don't know if you ever heard about her, La Passionaria, who was a woman, a revolutionary woman in Spain, who mm -hmm. was imprisoned. She uh, miraculously she wasn't killed, mm -hmm. but she spent her basically years and years, thirty years, probably Gary would probably know this better than I do, in prison, mm -hmm. and uh, she fought exactly for the same idea. So I, oh. it seems that this was. Definitely there on both yeah. sides of the Atlantic. Sure. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you for your comments. Um, that's fascinating because Timothy Lucas, um, her, she's also called the Passionera. Yeah. The Passionera de Gas. So that's really interesting. And um, yeah, the global context, the Congress yeah. is commenting on that. In fact, they're very concerned about fascism. And they're labeling racism in the United States as a form of fascism. Right, that's what they're saying, it's, it's fascist and un-American. Jim Crow laws, these deportation regimes, um, eerily look like, um, so they're using that rhetoric, right, because of all the more concerns at the moment. Um, so that's, yeah, that's really interesting, but I wonder if there's a connection. Yeah. yeah they're definitely, um, you know, globally aware. Like this of women, Communist like Party. The same thing. Sure, yeah. Right, the internationalism. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing, of course, which is happening 1939, 1940 on the civil rights front is the mobilization of A. Philip Randolph and the sleeping car porters and the 1940 March on Washington. Uh, what was the interaction between the Chicano, Mexican American civil rights movement with the African American civil rights movement. I mean, which which also uh, did involve uh, American communists. Yeah. Great question. Um, so there is again, the Congress does voice support for 
um, the larger labor movement, the African American struggle. They call for an end to Jim Crow segregation, which is really important because, again, LULAC and other kind of more conservative Mexican American groups, um, Mexicans are legally white um, in legal language, right? They can appeal to that by this kind of weird situation that when they became, when the treaty made them citizens, only white people could be citizens. So the courts interpreted that sometimes as them being white. So there was an attempt by some Mexican American organizations like LULAC to appeal to whiteness as a way of alleviating themselves from segregation, but not necessarily saying anything was wrong with it among Asians and African Americans and American Indians, right? Um, so it's very important that Congress, you know, had stake in that position. Um, there was also a black Congress, a national black Congress, I believe in the same year. So this is the Communist Party kind of creating these spaces among communities of color. I think the Black Congress was in North Carolina at the time, um, with a similar agenda, right? What is the situation of Black Americans? What is the analysis of their kind of history and you know road to freedom and and, and, and the call to unify folks uh, to you know kind of create a better country or whatnot? Um, and so there was a connection there, um, but again, you know, sparse evidence for for some of that stuff. But the, the Congress clearly had a position in support of black workers. <coughs> What did the U.S.-Mexico border look like before the Border Patrol was founded? I mean, were the, were, was, that, was that border essentially open, or, or what did it look like? Good question. Um, yeah, it was sparsely, you know, it was sparsely, it wasn't patrol the same way. There was customs, they had custom agents um, in the 19-teens. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, one story I gave my family, my grandmother, was born in Tamaulipas, Mexico. Her mother was born in South Texas. Um, so it was a common kind of crisscrossing of the border that wasn't, wasn't restricted. And um, of course, this is also evident in the industries that used Mexican labor. Um, in fact, uh, during the Bracero program, uh, when a guest official guest worker program was implemented, um, employers, agricultural employers complained about it. They liked the good old days when you could, folks could just come over the border and it wasn't a problem. They'd hire them to do some work, pay them whatever they wanted, and they'd go back. They didn't like all these requirements and kind of government oversight. And so it was very fluid at the time. Although it begins to, um, the Mexican Revolution is really a moment where, you know, the U.S. sends uh, the army down there a few times. There's fear of the revolution <coughs> going over into the United States. That's the Brown Scare, it's sometimes called. Um, where there begins to be this larger concern about the border and the idea of militarizing it is kind of introduced and, and implemented. But yeah, it was largely open. different ways, but the stigma of it is kind of a, 
um, something that's shared. And so that, that is the basis for kind of immigrant, the immigrant rights movement, the dreamer movement, um, movements like this that are uh, um, trying to, to, to solve the deportation kind of issue. Um, and the idea that um, there's, there's been dialogue between immigrant rights activists, particularly Latino immigrant rights activists, and Black Lives Matter in terms of that the deportation system is a, a policing system. Right, and it's a, it's it's, it's state sanctioned violence that needs to be you know addressed in a similar if not overlapping way. And so there's actually a really um, interesting group called the Black Alliance for Immigration Reform. One of the founders of Black Lives Matter is is the founder of that organization. So there are you know black immigrants who are also subject to deportation and whatnot. Um, and so that organization I think is a really good example of the overlap between the way um, race is and state sanctioned violence are linked together, not only in our policing systems, but in the, in the broad you know, national policing system of, of uh, ICE or you know, what Latinos call Latino, right? Um, you know, there's, in the Latino community, there's jokes that we have our own personal police force, right? More than, more than 80, maybe even more than 90% of apprehensions are, are Mexicans and Central Americans. Um, and so, um, so yeah, there's other links that can to be made. In that, in that. Not to mention, Mexican Americans also had issues with the police, very similar to African Americans, and so that link was made amongst themselves as well. Um, the Congress addresses that also, local police. Mm -hmm. I uh, you had mentioned earlier, like about um, like 1939, about that time, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of labor, a lot of Obviously, the fact that giving us time is made possible. Uh, 
the existence of Richard Marx. I'm wondering if you could kind of speak to the history of that connection. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, um, the group of folks that I think are afraid of um, you know, certain populations diversifying in the United States. Um, I think, you know, again, the immigration regime is a mechanism to kind of subordinate this growing population, right? To keep them in a subordinate moral position, right? And so I think it's linked, ethnic studies was um, emerged to also empower this community, right? To, to tell its history um, in a more critical way, um, to you know, analyze the history of the country in a, in a more critical way. Um, and so I think the repression of ethnic studies had is related in the same way. Um, fear of the population being empowered and changing kind of, you know, existing hierarchies in, in the US. And so yeah, Arizona, uh, it's no coincidence that they banned ethnic studies, Chicago studies in particular, and also created a show me your papers law that empowered local police to ask anybody who looked you know, undocumented for their, for their citizenship papers. Both have the same, I think, um, goal of supporting, keeping the population supported. In, in Texas now, there's a, so Texas was able to get Mexican American studies in their K-12 K programs. Um, I have some friends, I'm from Texas, I have some friends down there who are still back to including the group that brought the caravan. Um, um, so they have Mexican American studies, but they created a textbook. Some conservative group created a Mexican American studies textbook that is very racist, frankly. Right? Basically says that you know old stereotypes of Mexicans being lazy, um, that you know Anglo ingenuity was, was important to kind of recreating the Southwest and taking over the South. That was inevitable that that would happen and whatnot. So a group of Chicano studies. You know, educators are attempting to get that book banned. That's a really interesting new, um, you know, right-wing strategy. That if there is ethnic studies, then they supply the textbook, right? Um, the right-wing group supplies the textbook that that repeats these kind of stereotypes. Um, so they're they're battling that now in Texas. I always have the conversation in my history classes of why we didn't learn this in high school. Every history class, I have that conversation, and I think it has to do with power. Um, you know, some folks have an interest in keeping the, the narrative of the U.S. in a certain way. It's threatening when folks try to, to change it or rethink it in a critical, from a critical perspective. Can you, to your other part of your research, can you talk a little bit about how? the Mexican-American civil rights movement is then the Cold War ends and Vietnam happens and the, the African-American civil rights movement comes to the fore. Talk about how that and you know, morphed and, and, and helped the sort of the reemergence of that movement in the 1960s into the, and, and obviously to today, including the formation of Chicano studies and departments and that. How, how did that come about? Sure. Um, so many former con Congress, Congressal activists survived the, you know, the demobilization of the 50s, actually created other organizations um, um, that they seek to, to find political power. The Mexican American Political Association is one group that seeks to organize um, Mexican Americans to, to the Mexican American vote to elect more Mexican American candidates. This happens in the late 50s and the 1960s. Um, and the fact that they're, you know, there's, there's a, because of the McCarthy era, there's somewhat of a shift to more nationalist, ethnic based. There's, there's kind of a shying away from class in some regards to not be accused of being, you know, leftist or communist or whatnot. And so this leads to more ethnic based. Organizations, although the Congress was both, right? Um, like Papa, um, that emerged in the 60s and somewhat parallel, somewhat in dialogue, somewhat inspired by the African American Civil Rights Movement, Mexican Americans began um, addressing their problems and mobilizing them as a group to address their issues. You know, they're watching 
um, you know, the sit-ins, for example, um, and the dogs being attacked on, on, on African-American students um, and sit-ins to try to force the federal government to enforce desegregation laws and identifying with that. We're treated like that, right? The police, you know, harass us in the same way. And this mobilizes, especially youth um, in the mid-60s into late 60s, um, into what's about the Chicano movement, this notion of being Chicano, um, kind of pride in being Mexican. Um, we're not, we're unabashedly claiming to be Mexican um, on our own terms, um, um, akin to black power or brown power, right? Um, the goal was self-determination, right? We're also seeing the decolonization of the third world from the 50s into the 60s, right? And they're inspired by this as well, where Asian, African, and Latin American countries are you know, having revolutions, having major social movements, calling for self-determination. So um, that the idea is that the community should be controlled by the people who live there. And so there are different strategies that Mexican Americans take up to try to implement that. Um, ironically, uh, early on in the Chicano movement, in the late 60s, immigration is not a major issue. And the reason is um, there was kind of a lull in migration because of something called the Mexican miracle, which was an economic boom in Mexico that actually decreases migration for a short time in the early to mid 60s. And so it's, it's not a major issue. The Vietnam War is a major issue, civil rights is a major issue. Um, so the first kind of the early Chicano movement activism was really concerned about electing candidates, um, you know, um, local police, concerned with local police brutality, um, things like this. So there's kind of a, my book largely is about um, the first kind of Chicano organizations that grapple with immigration. Because some, some Chicano movement organizations don't see immigration as part of their, we're from here, our struggles are from here. These newcomers coming, they don't know our struggles, they're not Chicano, they're Mexican, which is a distinction made sometimes. So I'm looking at the groups who begin advocating for them. And you know, not coincidentally, these groups were mentored by uh, former Congresso members, former union activists from the 30s and 40s, who have knowledge of mass deportations from the past. Remember, these are youth in the Chicano movement, so they don't remember the mass deportations of the, of the 50s or definitely of the 30s. And so some of the older um, activists, again, this person, Mark Corona, was an important person, um, mentors them and kind of gives them this template. These are our people. What are we going to do? Deport our own grandparents? Aren't we claiming this is our territory? Like this was our original territory? How are we going to advocate for you know, the deportation of our brothers and sisters, right? Um, when we're, you know, we're part of the same people. The only reason we're separated was this imperialist war, right? It was the way the rhetoric went. So this notion of raza si, migra no kind of emerges. That the people, you know, the people together, the Border Patrol know. Like Border Patrol is the enemy of La Raza, right? Of the, of the Mexican people. So that emerges in different contexts. And, um, yeah, they come to that. Just one follow-up. Where are your view does the United Farm Workers fit into that? It was emerging in that same in that same era then in the sixties and early or early seventies. I know it's when I first came here to teach in 77, we were still sending students as part of January term out with Cesar Chavez and the work of the United Farm Workers. This is 40 years ago. Right. Um, because they had won contracts and, mm -hmm. and, and, and such things. Yeah. It fits in interestingly, and I would say United Farm Workers and Cesar Chavez are incredibly important to internationalizing the plight of Western Americans. That's, that's the caveat, right? On the other hand, Chavez and the OFW were on the side that, that were for deporting undocumented folks. Early on, in the, in the late 60s, or the 70s, the UFW advocated deportation of, of undocumented folks who were breaking their strikes. So they were striking, the farm workers were striking on the farm, right? And the, the, uh, the employers would hire undocumented folks um, to do the labor, to break the strike. Right, so it was a problem, it was a real problem, but the way Chavez initially sought to solve it was to call the Border Patrol and get rid of them, which, on the other hand, 
Corona and some of these other former Congress members, you know, differ <coughs> vehemently with Chavez on that um, issue. They argued, you know, our, our enemies are the employers, not our own people. You know, I have a good interview with a, a Chicano movement activist named Colonel Baca who said, the first time I met Cesar Chavez, I got an argument with him. And that's what it was about. And we went back and forth, and Chavez, I don't care who they are, just get them out of here. They're bringing our strikes. And of course, the other contingent was like, these are people. These are, we should organize them, not get them deported. So there's some important studies that have come out on Chavez um, that focus on that particular. The UFW even had a, a plane and kind of its own kind of border patrol. Chavez's brother, Richard Chavez. Um, uh, hang out in Calexico on the border and report migrants crossing to the border patrol. And the plane would observe them and they'd report them. So that was a, one in Chicano community circles that's heavy. That's, that's our Martin Luther King, right? It's, it's heavy to talk about. So that's why I acknowledge that UFW was doing incredible things, right? Um, but there was this deep divide about advocating for immigrants, seeing them as a people, or Chavez <coughs> being destructive. He shifts by the late 70s. He has to, right? The most farmworkers become um, immigrants, many of them undocumented. Um, but he's still, he still never fully, I would argue, um, even today, the DFW has a very limited kind of, um, they still advocate for just a, a little bit of amnesty, you know, some amnesty alongside. They don't call for the end of deportations. Other groups, you know, what you just call for the end, deportation should cease. And the OW is kind of the middle of the road uh, position on immigration. So. We have time for one more question. Did you? Accomplish them. 
I always say that it's not so much I hate you, I don't like you, it's that too. But I'm interested in it as a historical force in the way it accomplished certain things for certain people. Right? So initially, the denigration of Mexicans, the racialization of Mexicans, was used to justify the Mexican American War. Right? They're not um, ingenious enough, they're backward, they're a mongrel mixed race group um, that don't have the ability to cultivate the land right and politically take care of themselves. But I argue that in the 20s and 30s, that same body of ideas was used to control labor in certain ways through the immigration system. Um, and so yeah, it's attached historically to Mexican origin peoples um, because of that history of, of racism. Thank you for coming. Um, like I said before, check out the poster on the back wall there at the door. If you're interested in finding out more about the Cuba program. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.